Uh, so again, thanks for Pippa for inviting me. Um, I had the opportunity to share an anecdote that I've never been able to share before. So I met Michael right from NDI. So the last time we met was, was in Balichki. I looked up the city. So I said, hey, last time I saw you was in Kyrgyzstan. So I haven't been able to share that anecdote very much. Um, <laughs> Uh, who, who am I? I am a single shot N equals one Americanist that Pippa was ripping in the first panel. Um, I'm the co-editor of the Election Law Journal, um, and we're looking for submissions, so talk to me if you want to know more about that. Um, I've been working on election administration, election reform in the U.S. Uh, at the federal and state level for uh, about the past decade. Most of my work is in um, American politics and public opinion and election and methods. This paper is really going to draw on my expertise in public opinion and methods um, primarily. Uh, the question for this paper and something I've been working on in a number of related work um, is whether public opinion measurements of election performance should be part of our assessments of electoral integrity. Um, and subsidiary to this, if they are, what should these measurements be? What should we ask of the public? In particular, should we ask them reports of their own experiences um, in voting and at the election, or we should, should we ask them perceptual measures about, um, about how they feel about the election process? Um, and again, related, I think more relevant for this audience, do we have comparatively valid and reliable measures? Are these possible? Um, have they, or will they be? being asked consistently in national and international surveys. In this latter area, um, I'll admit I'm new to this field. Um, I've relied on the work of Sarah Birch, who is here, Nicholas Kerr, who I think is here, and I haven't met yet. And there he is. And uh, Leontine Lober, who just introduced herself to me, uh, who was very nice to already email me another citation. I um, mean, who I did not, is, is in my paper, but I did not put in the bibliography. So in the next version, I'll put that in the citations. Um, the other thing I want to give you for full disclosure uh, is that I'm involved in something called the per Election Performance Index, which is a similar project being funded by the Pew Center on the States um, in the United States. Uh, it leans heavily on work by Mike Alvarez, Lana Atkinson, and Thad Hall, who's um, on the podium, uh, and also a book called The Democracy, Democracy Index by a law professor at Yale, Heather Gherkin. Um, and uh, there is also, as some may know, the gentleman at the end of the panel, I think, is involved in the Presidential Commission on Election Reform, which is currently doing some of its, beginning its work in the United States. So uh, a little bit about what's going on in the U.S. in this conversation and some of the points of debate. Uh, among the points of debate about, about whether some sort of assessment of election integrity or, or electoral performance should be based on observable indicators or whether it should be based on a survey or perceptual measures. Uh, the second is whether we want to pay attention to the legal environment, whether we want to pay attention to the administrative environment, right? How the laws are actually being administered um, by the street level bureaucrats, election officials, or even poll workers. Um, or finally, what kind of experiences uh, the voters have at the ballot box. Um, so, and the third thing that anyone who works in the US knows um, is the vast diversity and federalism in this country. I'll simply read a quote here from a paper that Charles Stewart of MIT and I wrote a couple years ago. Quote, there are 10,071 jurisdictions in the nation that conduct elections on a regular basis. Slightly more than 3,100 of these are counties. Nearly 7,000 are towns, townships, and cities in New England, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Their size and complexity vary dramatically. Over half have fewer than 1,400 registered voters. 7,654 of the 10,071 have fewer than 10,000 registered voters. At the other extreme, 340 jurisdictions have more than 100,000 registered voters, and 15 counties have more than 1 million registered voters. So much for N equals one, Pippa. Uh, and then, of course, we have LA County. <laughs> and then, of course, we have LA County. LA County, I looked up at the break, currently lists 4,838,489 registered voters in one jurisdiction. They administer 4,621 polling places. They send their ballots out in 10 different languages. And they have 263 different ballot styles that they have to administer within that one county. So there's the diversity. The analytical strategy of this paper in brief, and I'm only going to hit the highlights here given the time, um, is I'm trying to do some conceptual analysis of the term confidence, and I'll talk a little bit about why I focus on that term. I talk about a scaling experiment that was implemented in the 2010 and 2012 uh, cooperative, cooperative congressional election study, uh, which I won't describe in detail here. Uh, I 
perform some reliability and validity tests of the current voter confidence measure, look at some comparisons of the stability of correlates or regressors, predictors of voter confidence over this set of surveys, and then talk a little bit about the relative influence or um, uh, predictability of voter confidence based on attitudinal measures versus experiential measures. Uh, my broad overview, where's the voter? Um, I borrowed this from Pippa Jorge, is that his name? Excuse me, in Andrew's paper. Um, so this is in their paper that's in your, um, in your packet. And so question number one is where's the voter in this process uh, here? And maybe here in some countries where the voter engages. There's a lot of the electoral cycle, at least as described here, that's not directly experienced by the voter, um, yet we're proposing to measure it by this index. Here is a similar um, kind of graphic that uh, Charles Stewart and I provided in our um, piece called the voting chain. Now this is focused more in the US and it's focused more on individual voters, so the voter has more activity here. So the voter registers themselves in the US, um, the voter has to come to the right precinct themselves, um, and the voter actually is engaged in casting the ballot. Um, but a lot of the process in preparing the polling place and of course a lot of the process of counting the votes is not experienced in any direct way um, by the voter. Okay. This is the measure of voter confidence uh, that's used primarily in the US. The history of this measure um, is uh, reviewed in the paper. It's really a product of the 2000 Florida election meltdown. Um, it's almost become a standard for American academic surveys on election administration and performance. Thad Hall is to blame in part for that, or can take credit. Um, and I've done a modest first effort in the appendix to try to assemble um, a list of the comparative alternatives. Um, I'm not gonna read those here and I would love criticisms and additions onto that list. Uh, so uh, I provided here the uh, wording of the American item and then some of the alternatives um, that you can find. A, a number of them are gonna be presented today in this work. Okay, so where are the confident voters in the US? They're in Texas, they're in the upper Midwest, they're in New England, but not Rhode Island and Maine. The takeaway from this graphic beyond being pretty, uh, or semi-pretty, is electoral innovation is not correlated with voter confidence. So the states that are more innovative have changed their processes, have lower levels of confidence, um, and states that are more competitive have lower levels of voter confidence. So if we could just get rid of competition, voters would be very confident. They're working on that. They are working on that, and this is gonna preview some of the, <laughs> This is gonna preview some of the concerns that I have uh, to come through the paper. Okay, so first, uh, this test. This is from the 2010 and 2012 CCES. One of the concerns over the confidence measures is asked in this Likert scale item, something that Walter asked a little bit about um, in the Q&A of the previous section. So it's only a four point item. So some of us had a concern that it had artificially constrained um, the level and variation um, in confidence. And the good news here is that it does not, it, the four point measure works okay. Uh, the mean and standard deviation pre post and across these surveys is relatively comparable. Um, so that's just good news. You'll also see here that the levels of confidence in the US, depending on how you look at it, whether you want to look at the top category or the top two, is, is pretty high. It's pretty good. And a lot of the discussion in the literature among the scholars is do we just look at people answering that top category or do we, um, do we bump the last two? <laughs> okay. Who's confident? This is again a kind of a reliability check looking at 2008 and 2012. <coughs> the quick takeaway here is if you vote in person, if you vote at the polling place or early in person, you're much more confident than if you vote by mail, like in my state of Oregon, or people who vote absentee. That's okay. If you vote for the winner, you're very confident your ballot was counted accurately. If you vote for a loser, you're a lot less confident. That's, uh, that may be a problem. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay. Uh, I'm focusing in here now on the what's called the loser's regret phenomenon. So now I'm looking at pre-post uh, queries about voter confidence. We asked them prior and after the election following some of the work of John Brem, a colleague and friend of mine, Wendy Ron, whether elections themselves, the experience actually builds confidence. Um, and again, the takeaway here uh, is about half, a little bit more than half, 55% of the sample is stable. Um, but most of the activity here is among people whose candidates lost and they express lower levels of confidence. These were asked about three weeks apart, so it's not a, a, a substantial amount of time. Okay, the next um, stability and reliability check is to estimate uh, multivariate models across the three surveys that I have in my hand. 
and all I'm going to do here is review um, really consistent predictors. So again, the mode of voting, vote by mail, is uh, lowest. That's pretty consistent. Uh, polling, places experience, polling place experiences, I won't talk a lot about those, but are you familiar with your polling place worker? Uh, is it your perception that the polling place was well run? Is the parking convenient? Did you have to wait in line? All of these are positively correlated with people's sense of confidence that their ballot was counted accurately. By the way, whether you had trouble parking is correlated with whether your ballot is counted accurately. Just want to point that out. Um, Diffuse system support. So any of a variety of measures of diffuse system support are, co are positively uh, correlated with confidence. And then finally, I've asked a series of questions in a number of these surveys about, um, about election administration. Okay, so again, the primary predictors here, losers regret um, uh, uh, how the ballot, uh, polling places is run and overall confidence. So uh, the takeaway from all of this. Uh, the takeaway, I guess, is more of a question, and that's what's the goal here? Is the goal here to publish uh, papers and uh, impact the academic uh, agenda about comparative election studies, which is part of what Pippa referred to at the start? Uh, and for that, voter confidence works pretty well. You know, we can make good predictions. We got good regressors. However, I can tell you my own experience is when I show election officials something like this, that is, perceptions of election fraud and overall sense of trust in government are among our strongest predictors of confidence in when their ballot is counted accurately, the conversation generally ends. Um, because these are things that they don't have control over. They don't have control over whether someone voted for the winner or the loser. And they want you to tell them things that they can fix. And if you tell them things that they can't fix, um, then they're not really very interested in talking to you. Thanks.